here comes the role of prediction of preeclampsia and screening for preeclampsia so how do we know that this woman might develop preeclampsia so we have certain age old tests and we have certain newer modalities now so initially we used to do the rollover test right so in which the woman was prior in the lateral decubitus position which she was turned supine and if the difference in bp is equal to more than 20 mm hg uh, the diastolic bp you consider her as a high risk for preeclampsia and this was done at around 28 to 30 weeks of gestation hyperuricemia uh, uh, an increase in the glycosylated fibronectin levels then certain cytokines placental peptides cell free fetal dna all these are predictive of development of preeclampsia and again uterine rt doppler velocity where a diastolic notch of persistence of the diastolic notch was given much importance but now we know that it is not of that much significance and we have better modalities at our disposal in order to predict preeclampsia so yeah uh, this is a this is an indigenous score developed by an indian by the name of gestosis score so what is gestosis score it looks very intimidating at a glance but let's go by it one by one so basically we are trying to formulate a, a diagnosis for a woman with certain risk factors so we are weighing the risk factors and we are seeing whether uh, this risk factor is um, uh, severe enough to result in preeclampsia with what certainty so certain uh, risk factors have been given a score of 1 certain have been given a risk score of 2 and certain have been given a risk score of 3 I'll start the other way round. So let's see what are the risk factors which are more prone to result in preeclampsia. If the woman is a pre-gestational diabetic, if she has a history of chronic hypertension, if she suffers from mental disorders like schizophrenia, if she's a known case of inherited or an acquired thrombophilia, if there is evidence of maternal chronic kidney disease or APLA syndrome or SLE, or she has conceived through assisted reproduction. all these are high risk factors for development of preeclampsia and have been given a score of 3 now um if she is a gdm uh, mind you pregestational was a high risk factor gestational diabetes is a moderate risk factor if she is obese morbidly obese with a bmi more than 40 if she is having multiple gestation or a hypertensive disease during a prior pregnancy these all are moderate risk factors and have been given a score of and factors like women who were born as sga maternal anemia advanced maternal age more than 35 women who have a teenage pregnancy younger than 19 obesity with bmi more than 30 getting uh, pregnant for the first time so nally gravidas short duration of paternity or cohabitation a family history of preeclampsia a family history of a cardiovascular disease history of pcos right very very important a history of polycystic ovarian disease an interpregnancy interval of more than 5 years assisted reproductive techniques by ivf for icsi and maternal hypothyroidism chronic vascular diseases excess weight gain during pregnancy a mean arterial pressure more than 85 all these have been scored as 1 what is the inference of this gestosis score that when the total score is equal to more than 3 pregnant women should be marked as at risk for preeclampsia so even a single risk factor from this would result in her being labeled as at risk for preeclampsia so this is the gestosis score which everybody should know i believe you cannot recall it um, and remember it or cram it but at least know about the high risk factors and have these charts readily accessible in order to calculate a woman's risk for preeclampsia now next is the full pyers model and the mini pyers model what are these so the full pyers model where pyers stands for pre eclampsia integrated estimate of risk right so pre eclampsia integrated estimate of risk score is what is the pyers model so we have a pyers calculator which takes into account the gestational age of the woman whether the patient has had chest pain or dyspnea what is her spo2 what is the platelet count what is the creatinine what is the ast and that is how you calculate her probability of having an adverse maternal outcome so all these come under the full pyers model gestational age 
symptomatology of chest pain or dyspnea, the SpO2, platelet count, creatinine and ASP, right? There's something called as the mini Byers model now, which is basically based on, um, not much on the biochemical parameters, but more on the clinical parameters. And this is very helpful in the peripheral healthcare settings or low resource settings, where you do not have the luxury of having laboratory assessment, a quick laboratory assessment. So you rely on the gestational age, any previous deliveries uh, more than 20 weeks gestation, whether there uh, was a history of chest pain or dyspnea, whether the woman reports any headache and or visual changes, a vaginal bleeding with abdominal pain suggestive of abruption, what is the reading of the systolic BP and the dipstick proteinuria, SpO2 is again optional. So you have eliminated the need for platelet count, eliminated the need for creatinine, eliminated the need for SpO2. So here you are basically relying on the clinical scores and the clinical risk for preeclampsia. So gestational age, any previous delivery uh, which is more than 20 weeks, chest pain, dyspnea, headache or visual change, vaginal bleeding with abdominal pain and amongst the two uh, measures, systolic BP and dipstick protein urea. So that is what we know as the mini Pyers model which again gives you the risk of uh, a woman having preeclampsia. The novel prenatal screening as far as ECOG is concerned relies on a combination of factors. So what do we have in the novel prenatal screening? It is a combination of both clinical factors as well as biomarkers and it includes maternal risk factors as we just discussed in the gestosis score. Secondly, the mean arterial pressure which is DBP that is diastolic BP plus one third of the pulse pressure. Third, the serum placental growth factor and the last is the uterine artery pulsatility index abbreviated as UTPI. So, maternal risk factors, mean arterial pressure, serum placental growth factor and UTPI. If you are in low resource, uh, resource setting where the PLGF and the UTPI are not available, you can use the maternal risk factors along with the mean arterial pressure. But do not use the maternal risk factors alone because they carry a low detection rate and a low sensitivity for diagnosing preeclampsia. Uh, and the screening performance will be definitely reduced when the screening does not include all elements of the combined test. So maternal risk factors, uh, add MAP, uterine RGPI, PLGF. And we know that when all of these are used, you have a 90% chance of diagnosing preeclampsia, which is less than 34 weeks, like preterm preeclampsia, a 75% chance of diagnosing preeclampsia onset less than 37 weeks, and a 47 to 50% chance of diagnosing preeclampsia, which is um, setting in beyond 37 weeks of gestation. So maternal risk factors, mean arterial pressure, serum placental growth factor, and the uterine artery pulsatility index. Now we have uh, something known as the SFLT PLGF ratio. So in the clinical diagnosis of preeclampsia, uh, tracing back the few pathogenesis which we just discussed, that there was a seesaw theory where it was in favor of the anti-angiogenic factors and the pro-angiogenic factors were less in concentration, resulting in a shift of balance towards utero-placental insufficiency. So we understand that the soluble FMS-like tyrosine derivatives, which are anti-angiogenic, they are compared with the pro-angiogenic PLGF. And if the ratio is less than 38, there is no risk of adverse pregnancy outcome and no risk of misdiagnosis of preeclampsia as well. Uh, whereas in case where it is uh, between 38 to 85, there is a mild risk of preeclampsia. And when this SFLT1 PLGF ratio is more than 85, there is a severe risk of preeclampsia. So this also can act as a good marker in order to predict whether the woman will have preeclampsia or not. The SFLT PLGF ratio basically based upon the teeter-totter theory of the angiogenic and angiogenic factors. Now in, amongst the recent biochemical advances, we have a novel point of care test which is used for the prediction of preeclampsia and it relies on the measurement of glycosylated fibronectin uh, levels in the first trimester. You can also think that in preterm labor we had read this fibronectin but that was um, in the third trimester of pregnancy, late second and third trimester. 
because this fibronectin acts as the trophoblast glue. Here we are talking about the glycosylated fibronectin serum levels in the first trimester. So increased levels were significantly associated with a rise in blood pressure and small for gestational age neonates. Uh, along with the glycosylated fibrinonectin, another important biochemical marker is PAP-A, that is pregnancy-associated plasma protein A. A low PAP-A level in the first trimester, uh, ideally less than 0.4 multiples of median, is also predictive of preeclampsia and especially future fetal growth restriction. The two recent biochemical markers which are into play are glycosylated fibronectin, which increases, and PAP-A, which decreases. So, increased glycosylated fibronectin and decreased PAP-A levels are associated with an increased risk of preeclampsia.